Force Command and Staff College, Major General Prabhat Dimitan Pitya, Deputy Commandant, Chief Instructors, Directing Staff, Foreign and Local Student Officers, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. It gives me great pleasure to be present here today at this very prestigious military institution. We will applaud the faculty and the staff here at DSCSC because they have taken profound efforts to make sure that this course stood by the stipulated timelines and that you all get to graduate on time despite all the complications that arose from the COVID-19 pandemic. I also know that you have gone through more hardships than previous courses because of this pandemic. But you have made those hardships an empowering experience which will help mold your character into example learned military officers. Before I go on, I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my sincere gratitude to the Commandant for introducing me with those kind words and for graciously inviting me to address the 14th course of the Defence Services Command and Staff College as the Commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force. I urge all the students, student officers, to finish strong as you already can see the light at the end of the tunnel and make yourself, your organization and your families proud. It is also important to recognize that passing Staff College is more than just achieving a qualification or post-nominal title. It is about improving your knowledge and capabilities while internalizing the role as a military leader for the betterment of your respective services in the future. Today I am here to talk to you about the Sri Lanka Air Force and the role that it plays in the defense of our country. More specifically, what it is we do, how can rise up to meet the future challenges and what we are planning to be on par with the changing global aerospace and security challenges. The purpose of the Sri Lanka Air Force is rooted in the national security strategy. You already are intimately familiar with the chart shown on the screen. This means that the fundamental purpose of the Air Force is to secure national security objectives through employing, deploying and developing air power. Our vision and mission reflect this idea and helps to keep us focused as a fully functional force. At the turn of the decade, the SLAF stood a notch above the rest of the air forces in the world as we had done the unthinkable. We had successfully defeated a terrorist organization that used aggressive guerrilla tactics. We proved to the world that despite our limited resources, we were able to employ air power effectively in counter-insurgency operations to gain victory over an elusive adversary. During the war, we conducted operations that do not belong to the conventional air power taxonomy that you have learned. This is because we faced an irregular force, a guerrilla group that showed no mercy or morality. In such situations, the classic taxonomy cannot be applied. It was truly a mix of all those campaigns and operations that helped us win. In fact, that aspect of air power ought to be a new theory and maybe one of you will have the honor of studying and bringing it forward to the world. Post-war, the SLA began concentrating on support operations such as training, rebuilding, research and development and capability enhancement. The change in focus is reflected in the core competencies that have been established by the Sri Lanka Air Force. Our vision and mission remain the same, ensuring that we remain true to our roots as an Air Force. This is where the Air Force stands today. We also have the liberty now to explore our capabilities in novel ways and to identify our weaknesses and address them effectively. From the present context, I believe that there are four major challenges that the Sri Lanka Air Force will have to face in the near future. In fact, we have already begun to see the emergence of a few of those. The main challenge we currently face is the limitation of resources, which I, if left unchecked, will worsen the employability and overall capability of the Air Force. This challenge can be met in two ways. 
The most recognizable solution is to acquire more resources, but that solution is sadly expensive. The problem that is inherent in the field of aviation is that simply buying new things. No matter how good the product, incur unforeseen costs that will affect the overall function of the system. For example, there are two basic questions that I have often been asked. The first one is, what is our requirement for a fight engine? There's a simple answer to this. The SLA have used accurate jet target bombing in 1993, which means it took us 10 years since the start of the war to come up to that level. The world is rapidly developing and we cannot let our advancements drop. Those past experiences are required to be renewed and ensure that we are in a posture of constant readiness to face any future threats that may arise. The second question is, why not buy a new type of jet to suit the modern times? Believe me, I would if it is that easy. Buying a new platform is expensive and carries with it heavy financial burdens. You are not only paying for the machine itself, but also for the flight and maintenance manuals, special tools and equipment unique to the aircraft. Training for proper maintenance, technical knowledge, weapon systems, which are often as expensive as the aircraft itself and much more. These costs have to be weighed against the expenses at the national level. Checking for feasibility and necessity. Further, there are strict criteria for such a purchase and only if all criteria are met will the acquisitions go through. The ordinate solution to this problem is to maximize the efficiency of available resources to increase output. This can be done by strategically upgrading and developing those resources. It goes without saying that SLA relies on two main type of resources, manpower and technology. Training is the only way to develop the most valuable resource, manpower. As the pioneer in aviation, Wilbur Wright states, I quote, it is possible to fly without motors, but not without knowledge and skill, unquote. This is why, as leaders, we must never turn away from any opportunity to train men and women. That training will one day become the bedrock of overcoming future challenges. Technology, on the other hand, more accurately, technological resources are developed through timely and planned updates and by acquiring new technology that will support development. As you may have realized by now, this ordinate option is by far the most logically effective in terms of the big picture. However, the truly to truly overcome difficulties, one must go that extra mile. This is where everything you have learned and trained for as officers will come into play. You must be a critical thinker and not let your emotions interfere with good decision making. And sadly, that is easier said than done. With all this in mind, the approach I have envisioned for the Air Force to surmount the ever-present dilemma regarding resources is to have a balance of both options I mentioned before. Our main focus will be to improve attack and air support capabilities through quick and accurate maintenance of the aircraft fleet. Augmenting manpower, developing their skills and knowledge through training is the key in this aspect. Maintenance activities utilizes various means of technology, be it tools and equipment or software and hardware updates. By ensuring timely and necessary updates to your system, it is possible to enrich the entire maintenance process, which in turn will increase our capabilities. It is also imperative that certain acquisitions be made as well, but these will have to be carefully evaluated. There is one more extremely valuable step that must be taken in this endeavor and it involves the men and women that serve. While training will improve knowledge and skill, 
but it is a guarantee that they will apply those in the best possible manner for the organization to achieve the desired output. To ensure this, they must be instilled with what I like to call the IPP factor. This is sometimes that I believe every service person should possess. Because of one, with it, one can do great things. And without it, the service is meaningless. What are the IPP factors? IPP stands for integrity, professionalism and patriotism. Integrity is the core of every serving individual. Sadly, oftentimes, the meaning of the word is controlled and it is true intention is lost. Most understand this is to be honesty, but integrity is much more than just being honest. The simplest explanation and the one I think is the most fitting is that integrity is doing the right thing at all times, even when no one is looking at midnight, where there is no traffic or even police to stop you from driving past the red light. When your people have integrity, they possess a sense of duty, sound moral principles, and make value-based decisions, and not decisions focused on personal gain. Through this, we can instill in them a sense of professionalism, which is the next factor. Professionalism will help your men and women to be cut above the rest, assuring that every mission undertaken will be accomplished to its full potential. It means that they will be the best at what they do, be it a pilot, an engineer, a firefighter, or even a clerk. It is guaranteed they will perform above and beyond the standards expected of them at all times. And finally, the last factor is patriotism. This is the key that will drive all the things that service person does in his or her career. Patriotism, the love for one's country, and the ideas it represents and the willingness to sacrifice for those ideas is the you know, motivation that is required to push forward and achieve excellence. It is crucial to realize that patriotism does not mean nationalism or extremism. Being a patriot does not mean we exclude everyone else to improve our interest and belief on others by force or terror. Instead, being patriotic means that you love your country, that you serve it with passion and loyalty, guided by a strict moral, strict moral compass that will help it grow in its own right. Now I hope you can understand how the IPP factors can help achieve great results and how this can be a novel solution to harnessing the full potential of the manpower resources. Another aspect in this regard to resources is the need to downsize our means to be sleeker or streamlined. However, the correct term to use is right sizing, where you don't completely lose manpower. In fact, it can help to raise efficiency by being smart enough to tailor resources allocation to help in areas of focus, which can be analyzed and decided upon as per the prevailing security landscapes. In turn, we can experience an increase in work scope and even have the ability to expand into new domains. This is another way in which the IPP factors can come into play. I would like to focus one of those and that is professionalism. If a particular factor is high in your organization, then efficiency rises. And combined with the concept of right sizing, it will help to lose the excess fat that achieve great results more efficiently, ensuring that none of the resources available go to waste. The second crucial challenge that the Air Force will face soon is to expand operations in the maritime domain. As an island nation, we need to understand that all security challenges will first come over the sea, whether it be through the waves or the air. It is alarming to know that these security breaches have increased as of today. Since the perpetrators constantly try to outthink law enforcement, these illegal activities include but are definitely not limited to piracy, 
the trafficking, smuggling of arms and humans, and IUU fishing encroachments. The latter occurs so often and appears in the news so much so that we have even grown custard and dull to it existence. That is another reason apart from the fact that this illegal activity gives rise to new threats to our autonomy to take steps to either eradicate them or to keep them in check. For example, recent data shows that Sri Lanka and its territorial waters has become a key transit location and that there is a frightening flow of multiple forms of drugs between the Golden Crescent and Golden Triangle. Furthermore, UNODC data indicate that three major routes of drug trafficking originate or flow through the South Asian region. These have resulted in an exposed maritime domain for smugglers and terrorists, as well as porous borders that threaten the territorial integrity of any state. In addition, illegal migration and exodus of refugees add to the transnational threats. We also face the issue of illegal migration out of the country which endangers not only the national interest but also complicates relations with the destination countries. Moreover, aggravating the issue, this unlawful migration masks the flow of potential terrorists, partisans, the radical ideologies, smugglers and human traffickers. Another important concern is the fact that resources in the maritime environment are subject to rapid depletion and this creates competition between players that share a certain ocean. The Indian Ocean is a great example of this fact. Talking on securing our own EEZ have taken the lead. Measures are being taken to make the efforts jointly to ensure we protect what is ours while doing away with illegal activities. The recently concluded National Security Advisor level trilateral meeting on maritime security cooperation held in Colombo last week is a good example of this. The seas are inherently the dominion of the Navy. However, as an Air Force, we too have a crucial role to play. The beauty of air power is that it can be employed in any capacity, which is why it is used by almost all services in the world to mitigate the adversities that I mentioned before. As such, the Air Force has a duty to improve maritime surveillance, to develop our technology required to operate in the maritime domain, enabling us to take an active role in preserving those value, valuable resources and our EEZ. We are working hand in glove with the Sri Lanka Navy. As the EEZ of our country is nearly eight times bigger than the landmass, the covering that vast area is something we are not presently equipped to do so alone. In order, in order for the Air Force to provide better reconnaissance and surveillance of the EEZ, we need platforms which can give us required endurance and are suitably equipped. To this end, we can currently deploy existing platforms such as C-130 and AL-32 until a dedicated maritime platform is secured. But the EEZ is not the only region that Sri Lanka must deal with in the maritime domain. We are responsible for the search and rescue region or the SAR which is bounded by the limits of our flight information region FIR. I trust that you already have learned about FIR and SAR because you would realize that we bear the responsibility of SAR and recovery missions for anyone who falls into trouble within this region. Just as a reminder, you can see the demarcation of both FIR and SAR on the screen. What is important to note is that the distance from our shores to the furthest margin of SAR is 850 nautical miles. And the size of SAR is approximately 25 times the size of the landmass. This is a vast area to cover and for that we must work together. Since it's our responsibility, joint operations in this field is imperative. A good example of this is the fire on board empty New Diamond oil tanker. The SLA was able to respond extremely swiftly, being the first responders with our surveillance platforms, which gave the authorities valuable information on how to proceed with assisting in dousing the flames. 
Through the quick analysis, the SLA was yet again able to deploy bamboo bucket missions and drop dry chemicals powder. Effectively helping in effectively helping in retarding the fire. This innovation was done with the expert technical knowledge of the Sri Lanka Air Force firefighters, the daring flying skills of SLF helicopter pilots and the dedication of the air crew. The Bell 212 MI-17 helicopters had to fly dangerously low through the smoke coming from the tanker to ensure that the bags filled with the chemical powder would land on the areas intended to get maximum effectiveness. I am proud to say that this particular mission was done for the first time in the history of SLA and it opened our eyes to the manner in which we can further improve our process. Throughout the new diamond tanker incident, our surveillance platforms such as the Beach King B200 and Y12 aircraft kept live watch over the situation. Specialized training is also required to be able to tackle all contingencies that may arise in the domain. And this is the very reason that the SLF has been conducting multiple training exercises with the Sri Lanka Navy, ensuring that we are always prepared. The third challenge is one that has taken over the entire world. And this frankly is alarming because it's difficult to set a limit to the expansion of this new dimension. I'm of course talking about the cyberspace dimensions. The world has now become overly dependent on the internet. Even I had to Google a few facts for this speech. With this dependency comes vulnerability to cyber attacks and a subtle cyber threats, identity threats, phishing attacks and internet stalking, bullying have negative effects on individuals. But this medium has given rise to far more diabolical threats. Our high dependency and virtual connectivity Autonomous advanced weapons and defense systems and interlinked command and control platforms which all use and manipulate cyberspace make the government and militaries extremely vulnerable against adversaries who are technologically savvy. I mentioned that this new environment is alarming and that is because of this simple fact. In the old days it took entire armies to take down an empire or a nation. Today, it only takes one person in his basement surrounded by upgraded computers and high-speed connectivity to topple a country of his uh, or her choice. To worsen the matter, social media manipulation and misinformation have instigated not only uncertainty in the society but also public rewards. As of right now, I know that every single person in this auditorium today as some sort of social media presence. With rising threats by the day, the probability of anyone of us being victim of phishing or ID theft or even false information is high. If such a social media handle is compromised, valuable information can be extrapolated by the enemy that can be the cause of a massive security breach within the military. So I would like to urge you all to be more responsible and wary to ensure that you are using social media wisely. As fighting as cyber threat seems, it's always possible to mitigate them. The Air Force has thus far taken steps to upgrade our cyber security, to test our own system for weaknesses using ethical hacking or so-called good hackers. We have already adopted and implemented a plan to expand wartime cyber measures which, which essentially support the employment of air power while providing a comprehensive cyber security umbrella for the organization. In fact, I am happy to mention that the Air Force's capabilities are nationally recognized and we are given the responsibility to spearhead the National Cyber Security Defense and Protection Initiative to safeguard the national interest and public services of the entire nation against threats that originate from the cyber domain. For example, last week our Cyber Operations Center was able to launch a cyber offensive targeting a worldwide live broadcasting of pro-LTT commemoration of the so-called Heroes Day 
from different parts of the world. A total of 10 Pro LTT websites were also brought down along with the broadcast that sort of tarnished the image of the Sri Lankan government and the military internationally. In addition, the information sharing and anal analysis platforms in cyberspace provide vital information for the fight against transnational crimes, assist operations during natural disasters and provide real-time access, access to information for civil and military leadership during national emergencies. There is yet another frontier that remains unventured by SLA. And this will be the new frontier in which we can enter. I'm of course speaking about the space. Most of the air forces in the world now have adopted the aerospace concept and have embraced advances in that field. However, reaching space is not a matter of sending a rocket. There are many international, legal stakeholder and moral boundaries to overcome. It is high time that we at least begin leading, learning, researching and adapting concepts of space to be able to step into the frontier. We aim to develop our air power, air power as well, because space and cyberspace power will be determining factor of control. Another field that is predicted to rule future air power role is the field of unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned combat aerial vehicles. As we have seen in the present past, UAVs, UCALs and UAS, commonly called drones, have played an important role in national and regional security. For instance, the UCAL attack was carried out against the rebellious Tigeri region in Ethiopia in the growing civil war between the country and the controlling powers of the region. The attack was deadly and showed the devastation that can be caused by these platforms. This can also be a great learning point for the future of warfare. This is why we have made extensive progress in developing our own indigenous UAV, the Linea MK1E. The project, although not complete, has made a great stride to achieving our goal of making significant increase to the capabilities of the UAV in terms of range and endurance. These enhancements also include the installation of an engine which has onboard power generation capabilities, an integrated power fuel tank, a robust undercarriage system and a more precise autopilot system. The SLA has planned to acquire new platforms to augment the already existing UAV fleet. We increase capabilities in this arena, the SLA hopes to reinforce the present reconnaissance and surveillance operations to detect deforestation and illegal cannabis cultivation and especially in aid of our maritime role over the territorial waters of the country. To restrict illegal fishing, migration through illegal means and activities of any suspected terrorist organizations or drug traffickers. These platforms will also be of invaluable use in peacetime, civil peacetime civil support operations, and in combating natural and man-made disasters. For example, SLF has already deployed drones on several locations to assist traffic police, to regulate traffic in the city of Colombo, and also to pin road breakers. In times of disasters, drones can be used to give live updates on unfolding events can even help to locate survivors and aid of and aid of rescue missions. The topic of disasters in one that rose to prominence in the country since we were hit hard by tsunami in 2004. In the recent past, we have faced flash floods, landslides, and adverse weather that have caused destruction and even the loss of lives. Managing disasters to minimize the cost of lives and devastation is not just a major concern at present. It is yet another challenge that the future has in store. The reason I mention this as a challenge is because calamities are unpredictable. And as a nation, I believe that there is much more that we can
be done to improve our responses. The Sri Lanka Air Force has already proven in numerous occasions that it is ever ready to deploy air assets in response to any calamity that has struck the country. Even before Cyclone Bueri made landfall in the country, the SLA was ready to deploy air assets and troops for any required mission. However, we are striving to develop our capabilities even further. For example, to enhance search and rescue operations with better equipment and updated technology. To provide training to be able to reach out to victims stranded at sea. To be able to save citizens from landslides. The most importantly, to be able to deploy air assets to maintain situational control day and night. A surefire method of increasing such output is through carefully planned joint training operations that will contribute to our readiness to save lives. The Air Force has completed a number of exercises in conjunction with the Army and the Navy to sharpen our skills and guarantee that there is no lapses in working together since we cannot gamble with the life of a human being. For example, when conducting rescue training exercise, with the Navy, the Air Force employs helicopters that can hover over a victim stranded at sea, while a trained Navy person will jump into the secure the victim. However, this is no easy task, since the winds, the waves, the sea currents and the downdraft of the helicopters can affect the situation of the victim and the rescuer in the water. On a larger scale, Sri Lanka adopts a foreign policy of being friends to all and enemy to none. As such, we are open to peaceful cooperation with any country in the world and it is clearly reflected through our international engagements in the sphere of training. It goes without saying that these relations have the potential to evolve to expand during an actual necessity. Good examples of these are the special HADR exercises that were conducted with other nations. Operation Pacific Angel conducted by US Pacific Command is a recurring humanitarian assistance exercise that brings medical and civil assistance to countries in the Pacific region. A joint HADR exercise was conducted with India where our AM32 and MIN flew to India. Japan and Sri Lanka have conducted many exercises together, together in the recent year. China and Australia have also visited to conduct joint exercises. These combined ops also help us to see, experience and learn to carry out missions with effectiveness while providing valuable services to those in need. We are fully aware of the potential that can be reached with respect to capability and effectiveness and are taking steps to ensure that those potentials are fulfilled in future. Amongst many challenges, the SLF has forever remained faithful to its role and serving the people in the, of the country and furthering its national interest. Like all other branches of the military, we too have been part of various nation-building projects. It's apt that these projects take center stage in the era of peace to rebuild and grow stronger as a nation. The SLF has offered a unique service in terms of domestic aviation by utilizing its air power assets to provide flights within the country, a growing requirement of rapid development. The establishment of Heli Tours, the commercial arm of the Air Force, is indeed part of the nation building process that limits the entirety of its earnings to the treasury where it can be used to further the nation's interest. I should mention that SLA does not intend to creating a monopoly over domestic flights. We have simply taken on the role until a suitable and a worthy enterprise takes over and continues what we have begun. The COVID-19 pandemic has made life a lot less enjoyable and it is a popular theme that the year 2020 is one that will be remembered forever in infamy. Gone are the livelihoods we used to know and the new normal is the biggest trend. 
with words like lockdown, quarantine and social distancing becoming part of everyday speech. Among the SLF, another such trending word of rather pronoun became CDRNE, referring to the course to the chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear and explosive wing. Our ability to respond to the coronavirus was due to the training and experience that the wing had undergone since its inception in 2016. They became the pioneers of pandemic prevention in the country and still continue to work day and night to keep us safe. You all know by now tremendous accomplishments made by the wing, especially taking carefully steps, careful steps to disinfect students who arrive from Wuhan, China. They have not rested since and are actually the most at risk to be infected with the virus. Don't worry, none of them are infected since they take every precaution to be safe. I would remiss if I do not also recognize the remarkable efforts taken by the Sri Lanka Army, Navy and the police in the pandemic prevention process of the country. We have been actively contributing to the world peace and despite the virus, we had a true protection that deployed to both UN peacekeeping missions in Central African Republic and South Sudan. Proving that our efforts to work peace are unhindered. Through these missions, we have earned Sri Lanka a good name and I am proud to say that our aviation contingents have a sound reputation of being reliable, committed and professional in all matters. This is how, as military members, we can bring glory to Sri Lanka by doing the little things right, being professional and doing the best in your job. In a broad aspect, it also shows that we as a country are proponents of human rights, that our service in both MINUSCA and UNIMIS through our commitment to protecting those rights, even in lands away from our own. The SLA plans to instill integrity, professionalism, and patriotism through the many programs and courses that will be offered to both military and civilians. I believe that teaching these values to others is a great benefit, but it would be most effective if these values are inculcated to those who will one day control the fate of the country. We are currently engaging with school children to actively impart an understanding of aviation and of the Air Force, using the knowledge and experience of our own engineers. In fact, these programs have also gotten a renowned interest in the Air Force, and it's a great way to induct young talent to the SLA. If they do not join, we impart the necessary knowledge for them to be an active part of the aviation industry in this country by showing them the importance of the IPP factor. Apart from the IPP factors, we require welfare to continue to motivate our men and women and to uplift the morals of the people. Instead of mere welfare, mere welfare we also focus on professional development as this can go hand in hand. In terms of professional development, we offer a variety of local and foreign courses to people from several branches to further their knowledge, learn something new and make innovations within the service. From a welfare standpoint, the SLF conducts a number of projects through the Directorate of Welfare and the Seva Vanita Unit. In addition, there are housing projects that provide houses for the families of those who are killed in action or injured in action. Another major project that is currently being taken up is the construction of a state-of-the-art Air Force hospital that will be able to cater to all aeromedical needs of service personnel and retired personnel and their families. All of this is done to lift the living standards of all Air Force personnel without any bias. It, but it must be stated that SLA does not tolerate any gender bias as well which is proven by its women's cadre, both lady officers and air women. A few weeks ago, we even commissioned our first batch of lady pilots 
who will pave the way for all ladies to aspire to become military aviators in the country. This is what we as Sri Lanka Air Force look forward to. Yes, we as a country have a vibrant history of over 25 centuries and yes, we are a great nation, but it is up to us to set our sights even higher on our own terms. We already have established the fact that we can achieve great things by fighting for every bit of the peace we enjoy now. And this is the opportune time to revise, modernize and adapt measures to preserve for the future. We should also not forget those who brave soldiers who made the supreme sacrifice in the name of duty, honor and country. Those who are disabled and injured due to their gallantry in war also are part of the legacy that has brought Sri Lanka to its victory. They gave up their lives and limbs so we can move forward towards a peaceful, just and happier future. I urge you all to cast the significance of those words and while moving forward to understand the value of planning, preparing and executing the objectives with a focused approach to advance capabilities, gain knowledge on cutting edge technologies and to persevere to develop yourself, subordinates and your service to better protect the people of this nation. With that, I am proud to state that the Sri Lanka Air Force has thus far made great strides in its mission to safeguard the nation. Working hand in hand with the Army and Navy, with diligence, it is my mission to focus those efforts of the Air Force to champion all the challenges that I have already explained to you, to defend against any eventuality or contingency, whether it may be conventional, asymmetric or transnational threat in any domain. Lastly, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the Commandant and the Faculty of Defence Services Command and Staff College for cordially inviting me to address this graduating course. As I convey my compliments to the soon-to-be graduates of the 14th course of this prestigious institution for successfully completing the Command and Staff course. I take this opportunity to thank the officers of the Friendly Foreign Nations for following this program and acknowledge their respective military leadership for further strengthening the friendly bonds with the Sri Lankan military establishments. And I also recognize the families of all the soon-to-be graduates for supporting them wholeheartedly through this endeavor, through the difficult pandemic lockdowns and other complications. There have been many ups and downs this year for you, but we have made it through together and that would make this last year ever more re rem memorable to you. My best wishes for all of you for your future endeavors. Thank you very much.